This is Mission Control Houston. While the Expedition 34 crew is busy inside the orbiting complex working on a variety of different experiments, a major experiment is taking place outside the station. The robotic refueling mission uh, is underway out on the far right-hand side of the station's truss structure. Again, this is a big washing machine-sized experiment that is using the station's robotic arm and also the Dexter uh, robot itself to prove that uh, satellites in the future can be refueled in space. We're pleased now to be joined by Benjamin Reed, who is the Deputy Project Manager of NASA's Satellite Servicing Capabilities Office up at the Goddard Space Flight Center. He has been an integral part of this RRM experiment. Uh, ben, how are you doing? I'm doing actually great. Uh, really pumped about the uh, success we had last night. Um, little little uh, sleepy-eyed, but, uh, but really excited that the first day of operations uh, was so successful and looking eagerly forward to four more days. So let's talk about why this is important. There's literally hundreds and thousands of satellites up, you know, both, you know, a few hundred miles away from Earth's orbit and also far out there in space by, you know, 22,000 miles or more. Why, why is refueling these satellites important and why is it important to demonstrate this on the space station? Well, I, I think you uh, you hit the nail on the head with your numbers. Um, there are, um, as is available on the web, um, something right around a thousand operational satellites in orbit right now in space. A thousand, and of those one thousand, um, all but two are serviceable. Um, so. Uh, pardon me, check that, the, the reverse. And, uh, only two of the 1,000 are serviceable, and that is the International Space Station and uh, Hubble Space Telescope. The other 998 are uh, not designed for servicing. The, uh, it's like having um, uh, an iPhone. A, a skilled technician can get into an iPhone to replace a battery or a cracked screen if necessary, but but not the general public and not without specialized tools. So these, uh, these 998 other satellites in space um, uh, can be accessed. We are demonstrating on space station that the tools, the technologies, and the techniques are available now for accessing um, a, a satellite's refueling system to give it more, more propellant. But it's not easy. It requires sophisticated tools. It requires careful planning. Um, but that's the sort of thing that that uh, that we do uh, for a living here at NASA. You know, let's talk about the history of this a little bit because we mentioned this yesterday. That uh, you know, there's been a number of times that NASA and its partners have had to go up and and service something that wasn't exactly designed uh, to have that happen to it. You mentioned Hubble because there's been a lot of work that was done on Hubble over the years that. Uh, it wasn't, you know, in the in the planning stages. They didn't envision having to do that, but they created specific tools for it. They practiced it, like you said. Um, is any of that, uh, you know, learning that we've had, both on Hubble and other satellites, is that being applied to this in terms of how you go about sort of, uh, you know, attacking something that wasn't really designed to do that? Absolutely, absolutely. We spent 20 years servicing Hubble. Uh, we, the agency. Um, and throughout those five servicing missions spread out across 20 years, uh, we became comfortable with the paradigm that the hardware was in orbit. We certainly knew a lot about it, although never quite as much as you wish you knew when you were building the tools and the replacement hardware. Um, so the hardware is in orbit. Uh, so we on the ground are charged with putting together a robust servicing mission, and that involves... Um, the replacement hardware, how is it going to be attached? Is it going to be attached with the same technique that the original hardware had on it? Um, the tools to do that work, um, the procedures development, what in the procedures uh, are going to be the, the special trips that would uh, cause the, um, the engineers on the ground to go into uh, a contingency mode? So, um, uh, so all that 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 planning, the philosophy of how you build uh, a robust servicing mission, was exactly the um, uh, what has positioned us for uh, being able to do what we do now on the International Space Station with the robots, uh, with Dexter that's up there, and our uh, sophisticated tools that we built for Dexter to use to service a satellite. Um, so what you're looking on the screen right now is an animation of um, the stowing of a cap that was not designed to be removed by a robot uh, when this cap was in, when a cap like that uh, was installed. Um, 
Um, and so uh, if, just a quick little example, if you don't mind, of uh, contingency procedures. Um, so we just last night uh, cut a safety wire. This is a very small wire, um, uh, 20 thousandths of an inch thick, uh, two of them twisted together. Um, you can see a fragment of one on the screen right now. Um, and uh, when it was cut, it uh, popped itself into a position that wasn't optimal for a subsequent operation. So immediately the team recognized this with the video that we got. And they said, okay, well, we know how to handle this situation. We'll use the tool that's already in Dexter's grip um, to uh, move that wire out of the way so that the, the following operation that would occur a couple hours later um, uh, could be successful. So that type of uh, immediate recognition of the situation and executing pre-planned uh, procedures uh, worked uh, perfectly last night, and that's the sort of thing we did time and time again on the Hubble Space Telescope. Hal, you know, one of the main differences between Hubble and, and this is that you had astronauts up there uh, with their own eyes on it. This is uh, quite different because you guys are commanding it from the ground while the space station uh, is up there orbiting. So. What are some of the challenges, and you know, does it make does it make you nervous to be uh, to be doing something of, of this size? Um, you know, with something that you really can't. I mean, you've got cameras on it, but you really can't see it up close and personal. You're having to do this remotely. It, 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 it's different, and it's the same. We still have humans and robots working together. Um, astronauts routinely would stand at the end of the shuttle RMS, the 39-foot arm, and uh, and have it assist them with their operations um, and now we simply have the humans on the ground controlling the arm from the ground so in that regard um, it is still humans and robots working together um, being able to do things that neither one can do by themselves as well or as quickly or as efficiently um, but it is different you're absolutely right the the innate abilities that humans have the the, the on-the-spot judgment um, the ability to assess a situation, to automatically adjust your hand, your wrist, if you're not um, rotating the screw perfectly axial to, to how it's screwed on, for example. Um, those are things that robots can't do unless we tell them to do it. Um, so we are quite fortunate that Space Station has uh, an excellent on-orbit Dexter's robot, uh, Dexter, um, and so it was uh, uh, considerably easier for us to put together a suite of sophisticated robotic tools um, because Dexter existed in orbit. And Dexter, of course, is brought to us by our international partners, the Canadian Space Agency. Um, so it is different because we get so used to, to knowing what humans can do and not even thinking about it. So it requires us to, to decompose the way humans normally perform tasks and to make sure that we program the robot and the tools to um, uh, to still be able to accomplish their their mission. Um, so it, it does require um, a different type of thinking. But I'll tell you what, we've got a great team here at Goddard and at Johnson and at CSA. So I'm uh, I'm incredibly proud of what they've put together. So you talked about the uh, wire snip that took place yesterday. You guys are going to get kicked off uh, this afternoon with some more activities. Talk about what's ahead for today and uh, the rest of the week. Uh, sure. Um, right now, uh, 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 Dexter, uh, as I said, has got two arms. Uh, you can you might think of it as a gunslinger with a gun in each hand, or or an ambidextrous mechanic who's got a socket wrench in one side and a uh, uh, a drill or another tool in his other hand. Um, so right now, uh, we've got two tools out: um, a wire cutter tool and the multifunction tool. The uh, wire cutter tool, not surprisingly, cuts wire, and um, and that's what it's going to be doing later today and into the wee hours of tomorrow. Um, and in the other hand, uh, we've got, we uh, Dexter is holding the multifunction tool, and in it is a tertiary cap, and we need that was removed yesterday. So it's about the size of, pardon the analogy, of a shot glass. Um, but uh, this tertiary cap needs to be stowed safely uh, to make sure that it doesn't come free at any time in the future. So um, we will command uh, the, the stowage of that tertiary cap, um, and then we will commence to cutting two more wires, um, and we will see where they pop, and uh, we will react accordingly, 
and that will close out uh, day three's, uh, pardon me, day two's uh, activities. All right, well, we will uh, continue to watch this here on NASA TV. Of course, we'll have live coverage uh, throughout the week. Ben, I want to thank you for your time. We'll, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to watch this stuff with these robots in space uh, taking place outside the, the space station. It's a, it's a radically different type of experiment, but it's one that's uh, incredibly interesting to watch. Well, thank you for the time to, uh, to let me explain what we're doing, and I look forward to uh, four more days of continued success. Thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you.